So, um, would you say that the uh, the megalithic yard then is a uh, is a valid system of judgment? Uh, no, it's not at all. No, no. All the systems of the ancient world. I mean, I mean, we call things like Roman feet, Greek feet, Assyrian feet, uh, Persepolitan feet. There's Chinese, Japanese, Aztec. You know, but it's all one system, and uh, you know they're the foot lengths come between certain strictures, you know, it's very, very well organized. And the megalithic yard um, is a bone of contention. It's a thing that just won't lay down and die, you know. But there is um, a re legitimate measure close to the megalithic yard. But you never find the megalithic yard used in rational numbers in any megalithic circle. So I don't quite know how Tom got to it. But um, present, uh, uh, research by a, a really good guy in the field, um, Howard Crowhurst, would imply that the megalithic yard was used in the, in the layout geometry, but it's not visible as a as a unit. You know, um, you would start me with that one, wouldn't you? <laughs> 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 you know, th this is the uh, the biggest bone of contention in metrology: the existence or not of the megalithic yard. But I don't think it's there. Fair enough. I, I mean, I. I, I was chatting with Adam Butler last year, who's done work um, on, his, on his late book, particularly with Thornborough Henge, um, mm. looking, and this surprised me personally, looking at um, the ancient origins of the metric system, which uh, I was completely unaware of, it, and uh, like most people thought it originated with Napoleon. Um, what's, what's your view on that? God, you, you pick out all the choice ones for the beginning, don't you? Um, look at what the meter is. I mean, this is how you do it. <coughs> if you look at a metre, it's one ten millionth of the equator to the pole. Mm -hmm. So in every degree on the Earth's surface, there'd be 111,000.111111, you know, uh, metres to a degree. So it's 111111.111111. Well, if you take as the measurement of a degree, the traditional measurement, which is 360,000 feet. Now, this would be a geographic foot, of course, but just take the number 360,000. And if you divide 111111 by 360, um, you can see it comes to 1.08, and this is um, a Belgic foot. So yes, the metre would have been known in antiquity. It would have been three Belgic feet. But what you've done is you've averaged all the degrees to arrive at the modern value of the metre. And this is not how the ancients worked. You know, they, they would take the various degrees and then the, the foot measures would vary according to the degree. Um, and there are deliberate variations in measurements. And uh, if, if you average them, you destroy the integrity of all of them. You know, so the metre's taken from, well, it ought to be around 45 degrees, you know. Uh, there is no ancient measurement that is legitimately a metre unless it's three Belgic feet. You get Sumerian feet come very close to it, and you get all these theories about things coming close to it, but you've got to look at what the metre actually is, and it's 111, 111.111111 to the degree, and that defines the metre. And does that speak to um, a particular point in history? Because some would have us believe that the Earth is actually in a state of constant expansion, so would that not? No, it's not. <coughs> um, let's say that the the oblate spheroid yes. is caused by the diurnal revolution of the Earth. Yeah. Yes. In um, in very ancient times, you know, I'm not quite sure when, but but geologic eons ago, when the first corals were being formed, they know from slicing up the first corals that the actual day, the actual number of years, uh, days in a year, was. Um, around 400 days in the year. So it had a much faster spin at that time. Right. Therefore, the, the, the um, poles would have been rather more diminished than they are now. But like within you know, the last millions of years, a few millions of years, it's been pretty stable where it is. You know, so uh, it, it's not growing, it's not shrinking. You know. So as the, as the, uh, the rotational rate reduces, the, the crushing effect of, of inertia uh, of centrifugal is reduced. No, if, so if, if, if the rate of, of revolution um, uh, slowed, the, the, then, then the poles would get longer, so it would more, more approach a perfect sphere. Yeah. 
yeah. see. Interesting. Um, uh, what we've come to know as the imperial system, feet and inches, yeah. were traditionally, at least, said to be based on the measurements of the human body, a, a man's thigh, they all are. man's hand. They all are. Yeah. yeah. Do you think it's significant then that, in as much as some <coughs> of this has changed, as you say, between Sumerian, Greek, Egyptian, uh, and the different sizes no, of no, human? No, but man hasn't changed. Okay. Not in the slightest. Yeah. Over um, thousands of years or millions? Or? Um, probably in a couple of million years. Yeah. You talk to Cremo and it'll probably be like 43 million years. I was just going to go, I was just <laughs> gonna go <laughs> on to that, actually. Yeah, yeah. No, I, yeah. I had the great pleasure of speaking to him earlier on today and yeah. I'm agreeing hugely with most of them, if yeah. indeed all of what he said. No, no um, men vary in size, of course they do, yeah. and um, they vary in stature between, say, a canonical man can be five feet four tall, yeah. and that would mean he's six feet of the what we call the Assyrian foot, which is 0.9 feet. Now, the, the longest foot that can be called a mathematical foot is the Russian foot. It's also one of the old sacred Jewish feet, but it's it's seven to six of the English foot. So the, the, the tallest man, canonical man, would be seven feet, and the shortest man would be five feet four. And all the different feet from all over the world, they all fit together to form a unified system. But that would be the length of the fathom between, say, five feet six and seven feet. And it's a strange thing that the British Merchant Navy took as their fathom between five feet, six and seven feet. So since prehistory, it's carried right on. So wherever the, the British uh, Merchant Navy were, they'd have to, they'd make damn sure they got from the harbour master what he was talking about when he meant a fathom. <laughs> Otherwise they'd run aground, yeah. Yeah, important distinction yeah. to make, I should think. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, <coughs> well we're here uh, under the auspices of Megalithomania once more yeah. in, in uh, Hallowed Glastonbury, yeah. in the Isle of Avalon. Yeah. Um, the, the, the tagline for Megalithomania is, what were the ancients up to? Yeah. Um, and that has become a bit of a catch-all for most of the things that draw people here, and indeed the things that we are we find fascinating mm. and uh, come here to learn about and talk about. Um, what were the ancients up to? Why, why is there such a correlation? Um, well, it's pretty obvious, really, what they were up to. They were managing their environment. It all went on for thousands and thousands of years without any problems at all, you know. And this is like, uh, and what well, it was filtered down to us from, from the ancient society is, is things like fertility rituals, you know, and uh, and observations of, of times of year and things like that. Um, that they were simply managing the environment. They were working in harmony instead of against it. And, and they, knew, they knew it was their job. They knew their lives depended on looking after the environment. That's what the ancients were up to. And they were bloody damn smart. Far, far smarter than, yeah. than perhaps we've hitherto given them credit yeah. for as well. Um, so when we look all over the world at the various sites, we look at obviously in our own British Isles at uh, places like Avery and Stonehenge, um, and then we look to the Americas, um, sort of the, uh, the Munda Maya in Central America, the Aztec and Inca in South America, Egypt, China. Uh, why are there such commonalities in terms of the structures, the astronomical alignments? Um, well, yes, yes, I mean, this is one of the first things that, I mean, John Michel was the first man to broach this, this whole cult, culture, mm. you know, um, and um, 